I'm Lou Russo, and uh, today we're going to be looking at my show here at the JCC, and the show is called My Life So Far. Thank the JCC for asking me to do this show. It was really an amazing opportunity. You know, you can go your whole life and never have the opportunity to show your artwork. And what I did here was, it's called My Life So Far. I have images from when I was a child and images right up until last week. And um, it's like right there, like it's, it's like your life on the wall. So I want to thank um, uh, my friend uh, L. CLE and uh, who asked me to do this and all, all the support we got here at the JCC and all the wonderful people who have come to tell me how much they love the show. So big thank you from me to you. This is um, some of my work hanging here on the wall. This is a little bio about me here and this is my self-portrait. All artists do self-portraits as you might know. Van Gogh did 100 self-portraits because you don't have to pay a model. And what I did here was some, you know, an artist will say, do you want to do something realistic or do you want to do something as a cartoon or do you want to do a caricature? In this case, I decided to do a realistic rendering of myself. And I used a charcoal and charcoal pencil. And people say, oh, it looks just like you. So this is Elvis. And I painted this, or I drew this, when Elvis passed away. And my idea was to make his face white, a sort of a death mask idea. And I put a woman's lips kissing where his mouth would be because it was like his fans were, you know, kissing him goodbye, all his female fans. So this one is called uh, Staten Island Side. This is the view from South Beach. And a, a woman here in our community Gail Middleton, um, every day she would go down to South Beach and take photographs of the sunrise. And, and we all said, oh, this is so wonderful. Every day she's reminding us that there's a magnificent, magnificent sunrise happening. No matter how sad life might be, remember that there's a magnificent sunrise. And what I didn't know is that she was ill. And she did this every day because of the fact that she was ill. And when she passed away, um, we went to, to, to her wake and we told the story about how she inspired me to do this painting of the South Beach sunrise. And you see here, it's what you call a double sunrise or a double sun, which is an, a, an illusion that happens when you look at a sunrise. P people say, well, that's impossible, but it happened. It does happen that way. Okay, so uh, I teach understanding the music of the Beatles at the College of Staten Island. And being a musician myself, the Beatles changed my life as far as how to play and what to play and how to write songs and how to tell stories. And so this one on the top here shows the Beatles transition from fab to genius. Their last show was done on the rooftop and that's what this building at the bottom here is the rooftop where they're standing with their famous Vox amplifiers. And you can see as they, as they aged, they started to grow mustaches and change their appearance a little bit. This one here is when John and George had passed away. And um, I, said, I sort of imagined them in the afterlife. What would, you, what would you want to have in the afterlife? I mean, you'd want to have your guitars. John's famous Rickenbacker here and George's country, country Gentleman guitar. When I drew them, I didn't want them to look the way people know them so much. I wanted to draw them as they were young, maybe before they became the famous Beatles. And here, because I imagined that the end of the road would be a bridge or a tunnel going somewhere, I, I put the deities here that um, may have influenced their life, Krishna, Buddha, and Jesus. And um, that sort of represents the spiritual aspect of their lives. So this one here, I painted in 1966. 
and we had moved from our home on, on DeKalb Avenue, 100 DeKalb Avenue, from downtown Brooklyn, which is really the slums, and we moved to uh, Bath Beach, which is sort of like paradise compared to where we were living. And this, when we moved, I had these recollections of my childhood home, which meant so much to me. And I, I was going through my work when I was asked to do the show, and I saw this one, and I said, you know, there's things here that I like about this. And one of them is this right here in the foreground is me sitting at a soapbox racer, peeping over to look at these kids who are playing Skullsy, which was a game that was played on the sidewalk. And here is my dad sitting on a soapbox reading his newspaper. There's the 100 DeKalb Avenue. This was a liquor store here. There's two students here who could have been going to Pratt Institute or Brooklyn Tech. I always saw people carrying portfolio cases walking along uh, DeKalb Avenue. There was a barbershop next door. We used to hang clothes before the clothes dryers. You know, this is my sister here, my older sister, who when she was a young girl, she went up on the fire escape, put her head between the bars and got stuck. And my father came running out in a fit of, of display of strength, pulled the bars apart, and carried her across the street to the Brooklyn Hospital. And for years and years and years, those bars remained bent in that position. <laughs> and um, so this is my childhood recollection of 100 D. Calvary. More to this story is, years later, Spike Lee bought this house, my family house. I was watching one of his movies, She's Gotta Have It, and they're sitting in a kitchen. And I say, wait a minute, I know that kitchen. And they open a window. I say, I know what's behind that window. I immediately went online to look up Spike Lee's headquarters, 100 DeKalb Avenue. On the very top is my first experience of making a woodcut. And to make, the way you make a woodcut is you get a piece of wood and you carve into it. And the part that you carve away is going to be white. And the part that you don't carve away, you're going to put ink on and turn that around and print it. And the German expressionists used this technique in the turn, around the turn of the century because they wanted to protest uh, being treated badly. My favorite artist when I was a teenager was Renoir. And uh, I loved his paintings. You know, they're so colorful and always had a beautiful woman and ch children and, you know, very appealing. And, um, and so I imagined Renoir in his artist studio with a model here. See, there's a naked model there. And um, after I did this, I realized later, Renoir didn't look like that at all. <laughs> now this one here is when Hillary was running for president. And I was saying to myself, isn't America great? We just had Obama, a black president. And now we're going to have a woman president. Isn't this what America is supposed to be? And of course, she didn't win. But over here, I wrote, she was right. So these are the th things that Hillary stood for in my mind. And I sort of looked at her as one Wonder Woman. And she's standing here in, in a pseudo White House setting. And she wore, Wonder Woman wore bracelets that would break male chauvinism and break racism injustice, intolerance with her, with her, with her wrist. And so I just got a, a post, decided to make a postage stamp of Hillary's face as the first woman president of the United States and slap it on there and make a glass ceiling that she was standing under. And so now we have Kamala Harris as the next possible first woman president. Down here, I was in a doctor's office one time reading about Frank Zappa at the end of his life. And um, he, his last, one of his last quotes was that the poets lied because he became disillusioned with his life. His, he had cancer and his doctors told him that he wouldn't die from cancer. His wife, who I, who I have here as a shrew, I don't know if she was, but that's how she left him when things got tough. And, um, he sort of became disillusioned with the classic idea that love is wonderful and, you know, you fall in love, you have a happy life and you have a happy ending. And he became disillusioned with that. And being such a great musician, it was an interesting idea to me that he came to that conclusion.
in the 50s, as I was growing up, um, I was a big baseball fan, and I stayed a baseball fan. I was a Brooklyn Dodger fan, and, and when uh, the Dodgers left Brooklyn, which broke our hearts, I became a New York Mets fan. And, uh, and so in 1986, I was lucky enough to go to the World Series Game 6, which the Mets fi famously won on an error by Bill Buckner. And my wife and I were actually sitting right here when Mookie Wilson hit his ground ball that went past Bill Buckner's glove. And it's shown right here. This is the Mookie and Buckner. And, um, and uh, Orozco, the relief pitcher at the end, threw up his hands and threw his glove into the air because the Mets had won the game and the World Series. While we were at the game, a parachutist came down, came right over our heads onto the field with this sign saying, Go Mets. Over here, we have Ralph Kiner interviewing Davey Johnson. And these players, because I was such a baseball fan and watched every game, I drew them from memory. I didn't even have to like look at photographs. I just said, well, this is Keith, and this is Doc, and this is Strawberry. I always remember Strawberry making those lunging catches. There was a play where Mookie and Dijkstra went for the same ball. There was terrific outfielders, and they went up for the same ball and crashed, but Mookie did catch the ball. And then we had Rafael Santana and Wally Backman and, and, and Knight at third base and Gary Carter, the great catcher here. And so I loved Shea Stadium. They, they had painted it this reflex blue color and put in these neon signs around it. And um, this was 1986, so I call it Shea 86. There was the apple that came out when somebody would hit a home run. So what we have here is when I graduated from art school, the New York Phoenix School of Design, um, I was there on a scholarship. And when I graduated, the first job I got working at an agency was to do illustration. And I, they told me to go around Manhattan with my big pad and a rapidograph pen and take the subway and get off at each station where there was one of these buildings that they wanted to show. Each one of these clients paid $500 to appear on the map. And this ran in Business Week magazine. And then also was a poster. This poster sold all around Manhattan at A.I. Friedman. People still call me about this. They say, oh, you're the Ulu Russo who did this poster in 1973. And I send them prints. And um, so this is filled with all kinds of things that are personal to me. I'm sitting here with my wife playing my guitar. And my dog is here. And this was our, our agency, Visual Accents, and I'm on the roof here. And I have the Three Stooges over here in a balloon. And I had Curly uh, initially with his hand going like this. And Business Week called me down to the printing press and they said, you can't do that because it makes it look like we're thumbing our nose at our clients. So I had to go down with opaque paint. I don't know if you remember this. In the old days, you had to use opaque paint to paint on the film and take his hand out, carefully take his hand out. And people still call me about this. And my idea here, which I, I used a lot in my career as an artist, as an art teacher, I made the perspective line not a straight line, but a curved line. And when you make the perspective line a curved line, the things that are in the center will fan out, if you can imagine that. So that's why we have this perspective where they're fanning out, because the horizon line is a curve and not a horizontal. Uh, a guy who climbed up the side of the World Trade Center, and there was another guy at a different time who, who went across the top of the of World Trade Center. And we, at the time, we had Muhammad Ali here in, in uh, Madison Square Garden. And um, I had over here down, I have Popeye on the ferry boat with olive oil. Here I have Tarzan jumping from the Brooklyn Bridge. There was a movie where Tarzan comes to New York and he jumps off the Brooklyn Bridge. If you look closely, John Lennon is here too, also on the back of this ferry. And I have here a Maya Koch, but I always thought the Maya Koch was like Frank Perdue, so I drew Frank Perdue instead of Maya Koch over here by City Hall. So these are all little funny things that I put into my drawing. And of course, King Kong and Fay Ray on the Empire State Building. Growing up in downtown Brooklyn, in the 50s, um, my heroes were the Brooklyn Dodgers, 
And um, because I was a little short kid, they called me Pee Wee. And so I became the biggest fan of Pee Wee Reese. And then as time went on, I realized this guy Pee Wee Reese is really a great baseball player. <laughs> and not only that, he was from Louisville, Kentucky, from a racist family. And he decided to change, to evolve, and throw his arm around Jackie Robinson and accept Jackie Robinson. And when Pee Wee was coming out of the Navy in World War II, they said, you know, Branch Rickey just gave your job to a black player. And Pee Wee said, and he came from a racist family, he said, if he's a better ball player than me, he deserves it. Very smart. Now, going back, Pee Wee didn't do anything that I wouldn't have done or you wouldn't have done. But at the time, it was pretty amazing. So here is Ebbets Field, and this is called First Game. And here's my dad down here and me. He took me to the first game at Ebbets Field. I'll never forget it because we used to see baseball on TV tiny. The players were tiny like this. And when I got there and saw it in color, I said, I'm going to do a painting where I'm going to make the players bigger than life. And I'm going to put it all in blazing color. Campanella and Gil Hodges, Junior Gilliam played second after Jackie Robinson moved to third. My hero, Pee Wee, Jackie Robinson, Carl Erskine, and Roy Campanella. Carl Ferrillo, who was an Italian immigrant, he, and he became a favorite of all the Italian immigrants, and the great Duke Snyder in center. And this guy was named Sandy Amoros, who they brought into the game in 1955 in the World Series against the Yankees. They brought him in as a substitute, and Yogi Berra hit a ball down the line, and he ran a mile and caught it and threw back to Pee Wee Reese, who threw for the double play, and the, and the Dodgers won the World Series. They never won the World Series in all the years I was watching them, against, especially against the Yankees. He felt in who was a chubby uh, broadcaster, he would have the Brooklyn Dodger players come out and hit ground balls to the local school kids, elementary school and Catholic school. And, um, and Lou Gossett Jr. was one of those kids who got to have Pee Wee Reese hit ground balls to him when he was a kid. Now over here was the symphony, a bunch of local guys who played really bad music, but uh, they were really funny. And um, when the umpires would come out to the field, the three umpires, they would play three blind mice. Um, the reason I made this painting was that I had a dream about Ebbets Field. And then my wife said, there's an article in the paper that they're having uh, a ceremony at the Ebbets Field apartment. And we went to it. And I told the curator of the Brooklyn Dodgers Museum, I said, you know, I'm doing a painting of Ebbets Field. And he said, OK, Lou. When you do that painting, send it to me. And so I did the painting. I sat on my ass for like two years. And then I sent him a print of the painting. He calls me up. He says, we're putting it in the Brooklyn Dodgers Hall of Fame at Cyclone Stadium. And so all the people that grew up with me in downtown Brooklyn and my family now in Bensonhurst would go to the Staten Island Yankees and see my painting hanging next to Pee Wee Reese's cleats and Jackie Robinson's glove. Here were three water, these were two watercolors a series of uh, about six watercolors that I did for Reader's Digest. And um, these kind of watercolors, if you've ever used them, they come in a tin. And what you do is you get your values, your tonal values, by mixing water to bring out, to go lighter in color and darker in color. In other words, if you're going to make this red lighter, you don't put white into it. You just add water to it. So that's how I did these characters, and I love drawing characters. This is a guy I went to elementary school, with, uh, high school with, Lafayette High School. This is a guy who was at the West Fest, who used to make the food for us, who just passed away. Nice fella. And here on the top, um, they were doing a, a book on the Roosevelts, and they asked me to do an illustration of the Roosevelts. And so the first thing I did was I drew, I drew the three individual people, and I drew them from memory. And I said, I said, well, I'll draw it this way, the way I think it looks cool, and then you tell me if you like it. And when I gave it to him, I said, do you need me to do it like with research? And he said, nope, this is great. So it's sort of a caricature of the three Roosevelts. Okay, so um, when I went to art school, um, I went to the New York Phoenix School of Design on, on uh, Third Avenue and in Manhattan. And... Um, I won a scholarship to go there, which was great because my family didn't have a lot of money. I tried for Pratt, I tried for Cooper Union, but I got the scholarship for the New York Phoenix School of Design. 
And my first advertising teacher, June Latora, gave, me, gave us this assignment. They would give us a headline called Thanksgiving, Our Living Heritage, and then give it to the artist to decide how would you show that. That's part of when you get into the advertising business as an art director, those are the kind of jobs you get. They give you a copy line, and then you have to think of an illustration or a way to show it. So I got this, I drew this scared looking turkey and I put it right there with the living heritage around it. And it was one of my school assignments, but I was going through my work and I liked it. So we put it up for this show. After I did the famous Business Week illustration, a lot of people saw that that was the one of the New York City there in, in a line. Fordham asked me to do one in color. So I said, all right, I'll take on the project, but how am I going to do it? I, so I changed the angle. I put it as a horizontal. I still have sort of a curved horizon line, but I got to do everything in color, mostly with color pentels that they used to sell. And um, here's, you know, my favorite bridge is the Brooklyn Bridge over here. And over here I have Shea Stadium. And over here I have um, people, these are friends of ours that live there who, who would cross the bridge, of uh, Roosevelt Island. Over here in New Jersey, when growing up in Brooklyn, all we would hear about New Jersey was Jersey eggs. So over here I have an egg stand where the guy's selling eggs. <laughs> and, um, and so now the transition from illustration number one, where I had King Kong on top of the Empire State Building, now he's fallen down. And Fay Ray is, is walking away from him, from his, from his hands. So this was a fun illustration to do. And friends of mine who went to Fordham, Fordham University always asked me to give them prints of it. So the one here on top, again, uh, my friend Gail Middleton, who I talked about with that um, one that I did of South Beach there, that sea landscape, she commissioned me to do one of the Richmond Terrace creative, uh, creative neighborhood. And, um, and so what I did was I got an aerial view of, of, of this area at Richmond Terrace, where Snug Harbor is, where you could look down and see where all the streets actually are. And I plotted it out again with my, my curved a horizontal um, line instead of a, a flat one. And, um, and it was a really fun project, and it was very nice of her to think of me, to give, give me this assignment. And down in here at the bottom, it says to the Staten Island Ferry, uh, you know, we were going to make this to the Ferris wheel. They were going to put in a Ferris wheel. This was a recent uh, project, uh, and luckily we didn't put it in. And so all the points of interest for people who live in Staten Island, you know, there's Adobe Blues over here and there's Snug Harbor over here, and, and there's all the f famous bistros here. This is, I have my band here standing in front of this uh, bistro uh, playing our instruments. I always like to put in little things that uh, only I would really know were there. And um, they, they were gonna make it into a, 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 they made it into a poster and also into t-shirts. So it was a very fun project and again, I have to thank Gail Middleton, who was very, very uh, cordial and very generous to give me a commission on this, which was really surprising and really, really a wonderful person. At the, it was a ca cafe here called the Everything Goes Cafe, ETG Cafe, and they would put on shows over the weekend with different uh, subjects. And they would put on a Bob Dylan show for two days, or a Beatles show or a Rolling Stone show. And so they would ask me, SIAMS was the Staten Island Acoustic Music Society, would ask me to do uh, an illustration for each one. And so I did this one of Dylan. And I always like to experiment, if you see, see my other work, using black and white in con conjunction with color. And Dylan is always sort of a mysterious person. He's always like looking at you like he knows something you don't know. And here he is, he's sort of hiding under his hat and giving you a staring look. I try to, to, to draw people not the way you usually see them. So I put little Indian marks on his face too, and I gave him this big hat. And uh, don't ask me what the greenery is, also like cabbage. <laughs> and, and so um, I did one of these like every year we did the Dylan show, and I would change uh, the image. So 
I did brought this part down in the background. I added in, in Photoshop, and I did a, a transition of gradients from the yellow down here to the the orange and the magenta and the purple, which sort of matches my shirt. And um, and a lot of people love this one. People have asked me for prints of this one. What I do with my artwork is I do a painting that I try to keep if I can, and then make a color um, a canvas print of it to sell so that I still have the work and it's not totally gone. The one here on top um, has to do with the war in Israel. And, um, you know, war is just awful, of course. And when you see it every day, the Vietnam War, the war now here in Israel, you know, other, other war that I've experienced in my lifetime, all those wars were just horrible. And, and so this image here is, is me with my guitar singing my songs. The contrast between making music, which it releases the endorphins, which makes people happy. You know, the, the, the difference between that and war and killing and children dying and all that. It's just such a tremendous uh, burden on society. And, um, and so this is sort of my statement. It's like, um, I'm still gonna be here singing my songs of peace and love while I know that there are terrible things happening in the world. So this painting is one of my most recent paintings. And um, growing up in the 50s, being a Brooklyn Dodger fan uh, and knowing the story of Pee Wee Reese, um, I said, I want to do a painting of Pee Wee Reese and Jackie Robinson. And then I said, how will I do this? And I said, I'm going to make them black and white because the issue was black and white. I'm going to make the field in color, but I'm going to make those two in black and white. And Pee Wee is, is throwing the ball off, playing it forward to Jackie, who's looking here to the future, like, where is it going? Baseball fans all know that Gil Hodges was on the other end over here. But I left the ball dangling here because the ball that they're dangling here is integration. I mean, Pee Wee is saying inadvertently, okay, let's go forward. Let's go, let's go to the black player. Let's take baseball in the direction of Hispanic players, black players, all kinds of players. I mean, uh, early on in immigration, we had Jewish players, one or two. We had an Italian players, one or two. And, and, and then we went to the National League after 1947 when Jackie Robinson had his debut to black players. And in the National League, he was followed by people like Willie Mays and all those great um, National League black players. Other teams like the Yankees, who were our enemy growing up in Brooklyn, the Yankees were our enemy, they wouldn't hire a black player. They, they told, they, they had, Willie Mays tried out for the Yankees. They uh, famously was told, we don't need an N person running next to Joe DiMaggio and, and Mickey Mantle. Can you imagine if they signed Willie Mays? <laughs> Love television. I'm a child of television. And I think television is wonderful. I think television develops ch children's imaginations. It, it, you know, watching Walt Disney, you know, seeing cartoons, seeing animation seeing color, you know, watching kitty shows like Howdy Doody, which was so much imagination involved. The characters, like, as a child, I said, oh, there's Flubadub, oh, there's this character, there's that character. When, when will the magic end? And I always wanted, I always had a, a soft spot in my heart for Howdy Doody. And I said, if I do a painting of Howdy Doody, how about if I make Howdy Doody the puppeteer? And he's the one that's holding the strings. And Buffalo Bob is being manipulated by the puppet. <laughs> you always try to have a concept, you know, that's different. So I said, with each of these paintings, I said, well, what would my concept be if I had to do it? My favorite TV shows included Roy Rogers, the king of the cowboy, he used to come on every Saturday morning. And believe me, I was such a Roy Rogers fan that my relatives called me Roy until I was 18. I would go to a wedding that I hadn't seen these relatives in years and they'd say, hi, Roy. My wife would say to me, who's Roy? I said, I'm Roy. <laughs> and of course, his golden Palomino trigger 
And you know what? Trigger was in a lot of movies before he was before Trigger was with Roy. He was in the movie Robin Hood, and Olivia de Havilland rode Trigger. And you could always recognize Trigger by this wonderful uh, bridle he had with these little white and black dots on him. And um, Roy's song was, you know, um, uh, here, you know, till we meet again. Happy trails to you. Keep smiling on till then. Wonderful song. And my other hero was Fess Parker as Davy Crockett, as shown on the Walt Disney show, Frontierland. And, and I love Davy Crockett. I said, you know, a child's imagination, you see a guy wearing a, a raccoon hat and with fringes and buckskin, and he's, playing, and he's carrying this long flint-like rifle called Betsy, and he's a marksman, and he's, he's a wilderness person, and he knows everything, and he, he's, he's like, um, uh, you know, uh, unfailing hero. And even when he went to the Alamo, he was still in our eyes an unfailing hero. And, and so I became a Roy Rogers, uh, a, a David Crockett fan and a Roy Rogers fan, but I never realized as a kid that there, he's wearing a raccoon on his head. <laughs> The raccoon has a face, you know, I'm saying, oh my God, the poor raccoon. Now looking back on it, I say, that's not, that's not nice. That's not a wonderful thing to do. But of course, that's how things were. You had to use animals for food and animals for clothing. And uh, because of uh, the Davy Crockett series, I became, um, I won a history medal when I went to school. And so the story of Davy Crockett, I pursued and read about. And he was a person worth, you know, um, idolizing. He was uh, a politician. He served in Congress. He never owned slaves. And the reason he got drummed out of Congress was because he refused to vote for the Indian Relocation Act. Andrew Jackson said, if you don't vote for the Indian Relocation Act, we're going to drum you out. We're not going to support you in your next election. And he said, famously, he said, well, I don't want to say the word he said, but he said, all right, I'm going to Texas. So Davy Crocker's motto was before you write and then go ahead. But <laughs> it turned out that going to Texas was not such a good idea. But still, admirable person. So this is my self-portrait during COVID. And during COVID, we had a lot of free time. And COVID was so scary and so frightening and we were so afraid to do anything and we were you know had cabin fever and um, what I would do is I would paint or I would go down into my music studio during COVID I did two albums of original songs that I just wrote during COVID and um, and so this one is me playing my guitar during COVID and these flowers back here are so, so, supposed to sort of be the COVID virus like that color of the COVID virus and, um, and when it came to putting on the mask that I would use, I remember my, my, one of my favorite artists, Magritte, and he used these masks. He had a series of uh, people w wearing this type of mask. And I said, why don't I do an homage to Magritte and put that mask on me during COVID? So this is an illustration that I did for Reader's Digest, and it was a story about a dragon who likes to eat chocolate cake. And uh, I did this illustration. What I was going for here is the extreme difference between light and dark. When I did this drawing, I drew it in line and then I made this whole side in black and this whole side in white. And I worked from that, working almost in opposite relief to get this dramatic shadow. And um, I was going through my work and I'm looking at this. I said, oh, I like that one. I like the composition. I like the lighting and I like the elements. So here I am again. And this one is my tribute to black and white movies or film noir movies. And I love, love, love the cinematography in those black and white movies. I love the use of shadow how shadow can create um, a composition, 
how it could make even the most mon mundane scene, scene be interesting just by how they did the lighting. And I always was fascinated by a situation like this where you have a gray image in the back that's flooded by light, but yet you can still see what's going on behind the light. See, like in here. And I figured that if I drew my, my, my lines of the image behind in charcoal, and then I threw white paint over it, if I did it carefully, I could make the lines show through. So we create, create the illusion that you're looking at a real image of a building with a flooded light here in front. And Fillmore is always dark and mysterious. So I saw this sort of scene here in a movie, don't remember which, and there was two men standing like this. And I just said, that is so mysterious. Like, what, what is this guy doing? Or what is that guy doing? Are they going to break into this diner? And I said, hmm, when a, when a person looks at this, they're going to say, what's going on? So I said, I'm going to put a scared cat here. And the scared cat has the same issue that we have. What's going to happen? He knows the cat knows something's going to happen. You don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen. The cat is wondering what's going to happen. No, we'll be running into